You might have to help me out here, Brian. <laughs> Shidduchin. The Shidduchin refers to the first step in the marriage process. It's the arrangements preliminary to the legal betrothal. It was common in ancient Israel of the, that the father of the groom would select a bride for his son. Just as God, our Father, God the Father of Yeshua, selected we as his bride. Oh, yeah. Biblical example of Shidduchim is in Genesis, Bereshit, if you will, 24, 1 through 4. Now, Abraham was old, and I'm reading from the NASB. I am going to add Hebrew lettering, Hebrew words into it, though. So, now Abraham was old, advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he owned, Please, place your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by Adonai, the Elohim of heaven and the God of earth, that you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live, but you will go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son, Yitzhak, or Isaac. In this passage, Abraham makes arrangements for his son's wedding. While the father usually had the responsibility in Abraham's life, it was not possible because he was of such an advanced age. It was acceptable, however, for the father to delegate this responsibility by designating it to someone else, a representative, if you will. It's called a Shadachan. Shadachan is a marriage broker, or, if you will, a matchmaker. Yeah. So, how many of you want a matchmaker here? You, you, all of you kids. Anybody under 20? Okay, anybody under 25 who's not married? How many of you want a matchmaker? Want your father to be the matchmaker for you? <laughs> okay. The next phase of this step was the ketubah. The ketubah was means written. It's a legal contract in Hebrew in in in, in Judaism. The ketubah was and still is today the marriage contract. The ketubah includes the provisions and conditions of the proposed marriage. The groom promises to support his wife to be. The bride stipulates the contents of her dowry, financial or financial status. We see this described in Genesis 24, 52, and 53. When Abraham's servant heard these, their words, he bowed himself to the ground before the Lord. The servant brought out articles of silver and articles of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah, Rivka. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. Despite the fact that it was an arranged marriage, though, it appears that the consent of the bride was very much a part of the ketubah. And it still is. Genesis 24 and 5, it says, The servant said to him, said to Moshe, or to, excuse me, to Abraham, Suppose the woman is not willing to follow me to this land. Should I take your son back to the land from where you came? People think that arranged marriages means that the bride does not have a choice. The bride does have a choice. We have a choice. And it's according to what we choose to do with our lives as to what he will do or what the son will do. <clears throat> when Israel did not fulfill the needs, what happened? The son came to this land to be able to purchase us himself. What a marvelous view of Messiah's love for us, his bride. That he would be willing to come into this land, a foreign land, to give his all for us. The mohar, or the bridal payment, sometimes called the bride price, it is a gift paid by the groom to the bride's family, but ultimately it belongs to the bride. It changes her status, and it sets her free from her parents' household. We see this illustrated in two biblical concepts, Isaac and Rebecca, and Jacob and his two wives, Leah and... Uh, what range is what they have? <laughs> Rachel. Rachel, thank you. Okay. 
The mikvah or the ritual immersion is the next thing. Although not mentioned in the narrative, to prepare for betrothal, it was common for the bride and the groom to separately take a ritual immersion. The ritual immersion of the mikvah, taken from the Hebrew, was prior to actually entering into the formal betrothal period and was symbolic of spiritual cleansing. It's illustrated in Messiah's bride this way. The Shidduchim starts with the father's selection of a bride for his beloved son. So too were we selected by the father to be his beloved son's loving, precious bride. Ephesians 1 and 4 says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. As in the case of Isaac, Yitzhak, there is also a matchmaker. 2 Corinthians, <coughs> excuse me, 2 Corinthians 11, 10 through 12. As the truth of Messiah is in me, this boasting of mine will not be stopped in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. But what I am doing, I will continue to do so that I may cut off opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the matter about which they are boasting. Do you understand that? He is so jealous of us, so concerned for us, that what he does is he will compete if he has to, to gain us. How many of you have ever believed and have walked away from that belief of God, gotten away from God? Do we ever really get away from God? The world offers us everything that it has to give. I was there. I've been there. I've been in the trenches. Those of you who know my testimony know that the man standing before you is not the man that I was when I was 20, 21 years old. I ran with hell's angels. I knew what it was to do the drug scene. I knew what it was to have people put in the hospital at any given time that I wasn't going to put in there. But God changed my heart because God knew me as a child. He called me as a child. And he wasn't about to let go. I tell the kids in the congregation, and I told one the other night, when God wants something from you, the smartest thing for you to do is to listen and obey. Because he will get his way. Yeah, absolutely. It took me 40 years to step into the calling that God had for me. And though it's been tough, rough, and hard, <clears throat> I am the happiest I've ever been. He will compete with whoever he has to compete with to bring you back to his throne. To bring you back to the place. We also have the legal contract, the Ketub, which is the Brit Hadashah, the New Covenant, the New Testament, if you will. We also have the what? The Tanakh. The two are interchangeable. The two are one. You can't have one without the other one anymore. The Tanakh can stand on its own were it not for Messiah having come. But when Messiah came, the Tanakh cannot stand on its own any longer. It has to stand with Messiah. Because Messiah was the fulfillment of the Tanakh. And by that, I don't mean that the Tanakh is no longer useful. I'm saying that by that, when he came, he fulfilled. He said, I have become the sacrifice now. I am the blood sacrifice. It doesn't mean that we don't follow Torah. It simply means that now we don't have to make the blood sacrifices every year at Yom Kippur. Because according to Scripture, he, what? He gave himself as a ransom for many. And once having done that, he no longer, there's no longer a sacrifice needed because he is that supreme sacrifice. That's why we're not sacrificing lambs and goats and doves and pigeons and uh, calves and heifers up here today because we have his blood covering us for all time.